have built a few Gauge 1 live steam locomotives so far. This is the next one I'm going to build and it's going to be scratch built and it's going to be live steam and I hope you find the series of following videos interesting to watch. Hello and welcome to part 32 of the Gauge 1 GWR Prairie Tank scratch build. Um, what I've been doing for the last, oh, for the last good few weeks is lots of uh, little jobs really. Lots of um, details and little tweaks here and there. Probably too numerous to mention, just little adjustments, fine adjustments and things I've been doing. Um, one of them was a little bit more detail on the, on the tender. Uh, I realised actually again actually having a closer look at the real thing is there was still some detail I was missing namely uh, just some little steps that fit on here that fit on fit on the back of the tender and there's a couple of little brackets that fit on the tender as well so I spent some time doing those um, the other things I've done is I've made the front and rear buffers show you those uh, made the front and rear buffers fitted those on and um, here's the the ones on the rear and that's what the what the buffer looks like so I'll just show you what that consists of so here's the buffer uh, just take the little screw off the back and just undo undo this nut here just hold that a second. So what you have is we've got the main body, a little stud in there with the spring, slides over there and fits into the body and that's all held in place with just a little a little nut at the back. So what we'll do, we'll just take um, just a few minutes just to show you some of the pictures of the work that's been going on the last couple of weeks. So starting off with a piece of square brass bar, pop it in the four jaw chuck, all squared up, and then we turn a shoulder on there. This shoulder is going to have a thread on that's actually going to screw in to the buffer beam itself. And there's our 2BA thread and the four main buffer parts of the body made. Next we turn them round and just pop them in a little holder so we can turn down the other end of the buffer body. This is going to have a larger thread on there and this is what's going to be held into the main part of the buffer beam. Once we've done that, just drill out the centre uh, for the little rod that's going to go in. And you can see also that we've got the main part of the buffer shape now. And there's the completed buffer body. And you can see the at a, um, 2BA thread on one end that's going to fix into the butter buffer beam and going to be held on with a nut and you can see the other end which is where the buffer will slide into. Now starting on the buffer itself made from mild steel so face it off and then turn down to get a shoulder. That shoulder part that's turned down that's what's going to slide into the buffer body. Once we've done that we drill it out and we're going to drill and tap that 10BA that's going to take the little stud that's going to hold the spring in. Once we've done that, turn it round, just put it in the ordinary three-jaw chuck and starting to face, get the face for the buffer itself. So facing that off initially and just gently getting the shape of the buffer itself. Gently turning that a little bit at a time and just finally finishing that off with a file and a polish to get the radius that we want. And this is something I didn't mention earlier on in the video is actually making the chimney uh, that's going to obviously fit on the um, on the smoke box. So we start off held in our vice as you can see and we've got a I've got a fly cutter there set to a two inch radius which represents the radius of the smoke box. So what we do is gradually mill out a radius in there that's actually feel like going to be the saddle that's going to sit on the smoke box once that's done pop it in our chuck and drill it out half inch diameter 
ready for fitting on the smoke box. This is going to fit on the smoke box that's being drilled out there. And I reamed it out just to make sure we're going to get a nice tight fit. Once that happened, I've put that on a mandrel, as you can see there. Turn the end down, starting to turn the end down to get the shape of the chimney itself. That's just a quick test, just to make sure that's a nice fit on the smoke box. And there's the, the, the two faces mate, mate nicely. So once we've got that, is we pop that back on our mandrel and start to get the shape of the actual chimney itself. Just roughing it down to the, the basic diameter first. Then when we've got that diameter, then starting to gently turn down the profile that we want. Once we've got that profile all looking good, this is just turning the uh, copper uh, finial or I think whatever it's called, a copper bit that fits on the end of the chimney. This classic feature of Great Western locomotives. So that's just made from a, copper, a piece of copper bar bored out and then a force fit onto our brass chimney and that's finally shaped and polished up to give us our shape that we're looking for. And there's the completed item. And you can see that I think that looks uh, pretty reasonable there and that looks okay. The other thing I didn't mention on the, uh, the beginning of the video again was making the steps. For the steps for the running plate, carving out the shape that we need, clamp the two together so we're making two together. These are going to be the rear steps that steps into the cab. We've got that shape there, aligning it up, setting it up to make the small steps. Once we've got the steps on, I've just actually riveted the steps on just to hold them while I finally solder those into position and they'll be smoothed out. So there's the rear steps for the cab. And it's the same process for the front steps, which are a little bit simpler to make. Carve the shapes out. There they are with their steps ready to be soldered into position. And these are soldered on and these are slightly actually bent round. Once they're on there, the ends are just curved round just to add a little bit more authenticity as you can see there. And there's a finished example. I hope you found just that series of pictures and what I've been doing interesting and just to give you an idea of what I've been up to. And apologies for any background noise that you can hear. It's raining quite heavily outside and what you can hear is the rain hammering down on the roof if that's coming through on the audio. So I can think of no better place to be on a rainy afternoon than in the workshop. Okay, there's all the uh, bits that I've mentioned. Um, the next thing, probably the last thing um, that we'll be doing on this locomotive before we're ready for paint, before we're ready for final assembly and painting, is the lubrication system. I think I've mentioned this once or twice in the past about the lubrication. Steam engines have to have lubrication with steam oil. If you don't have lubrication with steam oil in, they stiff, they, they're stiff inside and they don't run particularly well. And it makes a big, big difference with a little bit of steam oil lubrication. Now, there's a couple of ways this can be done. On engines this size, um, there's probably, there's a couple of ways to do it to create a lubricator. There's sort of a displacement lubricator and one, um, a force fed type of lubricator. Uh, the project, if you remember the project, the Fowler F4, the black locomotive, that has probably what I call a force lubricator. And what that looks like is you have a, a, uh, a reservoir here, like so, and you essentially take some steam from the regulator and this arrangement by where when you open the regulator there's also a small bypass that lets a little bit of steam through into this that's a filler that goes in there as well so some steam goes into here steam enters this is this has um, some oil in it so steam comes into here condenses creates water and it also creates pressure and what it will do, it will then force 
saturated steam oil out of the top pipe and along and into the cylinder. Um, on this locomotive you've not really got the room to fit something like that in the cab. So the next approach is what you have what you call a, a displacement lubricator. Very similar to this one. So again you have an arrangement you would have a reservoir, a tank, a holder and you have a steam pipe coming in it goes through and the pipe comes out the other side and what you have inside in here is a tiny little hole so as the steam comes through steam enters here condenses and again as it condenses water and saturated steam will then find their way out through that little hole and along and into the cylinders and that's a bit like that's what you call um, a displacement lubricator now there's another type that I've used on one of my other locomotives I've used it on the Patriot the maroon uh, the maroon locomotive I've, I've used it a different type of arrangement again on this one and I didn't think this would work at first and I saw it in use on another locomotives when I was visiting somewhere else and what you have and on this one is you have a again a tank a Samus small reservoir this time it's horizontal and it'll fit in between the and it fitted in between the front frames and my pen has just conveniently run out so we are going again and it fits in between the front frames there's the frames of the locomotives and here's the wheels down here and so it fits in between the front frames so this is a front view and all this has looking at a side view it just has one pipe running in here connected to the uh, steam inlet on the cylinders I'm going to find another pen okay we have our our replacement pen so as I mentioned this is a side view and you would have oil in here like so and this goes off the T-junction into the cylinders of the locomotive and so this is the arrangements I've used on the Patriot now I was a little bit skeptical that that would work because you're just forcing steam in there well if it's forcing steam in there how is steam going to get out because with these others you've got something coming in and you've got something coming out but it does work and I've got it on my Patriot and it works fine so this is what I'm going to do for our prairie tank base is pretty tight here um, the only real sensible place it's going to go, the logical place where there's any space, it's got to go in a, in, a, in a position where you can basically get at the thing to fill it up with oil. And there's also got to be room where it doesn't interfere with anything else. So this is the shape, probably sensible place or one of the most likely places to put it is in the front here. Because that means I can get at it as well. Now it's going to be mounted just above the front bogey but it's got enough clearance to allow the bogey wheels to flex up and down when it's on the track so it's not going to foul the bogey wheels. The other thing it has to have room for is also the smoke box is going to be fitted here. So you've got to be able to get at the thing. So that just leaves me enough room to mount something here and to be able to get at it but again because of the where it is and its size it has to be this size because these front bogies when it's on the track will do that and it's taking a bend so there has to be enough clearance obviously for the front bogies to move left and right so that's probably about the optimum size that it will allow me to make okay here's the start of our top piece being machined and what you can see I've 
made this bit this is what's going to take the filler cap so we need some thread on there I'm going to thread that with a I believe that's going to be an M4 so I'm going to use a countersunk M4 screw for the filler cap so I've turned that down that's going to take the thread this part it's turned down so that will fit over there like so and I'm going to leave this as thin as possible really because we're really quite tight for height so let's start off by drilling our countersink by drilling our stock okay drilled our tapping size hole and just running a 4mm tap through here okay there we are I just faced off the other end ready for the countersink for this thread you generally find I generally find putting countersinks in certainly on some materials you're actually better turning the chuck by hand it just avoids any chatter that you sometimes get so let's have a look what that looks like let me zoom in there so you can see there we've got a decent view there Let's see what we're looking at there. We've got a reasonable, nice countersunk top there. So let's just try that out for depth. I'll probably need to just touch it with the tap again. As where I've countersunk. That oh, might work. It screws nicely in. And looking at it, it wants to go a little bit deeper again, the countersunk. Alright, there's our second part made and you can see, I'll just show you on there how I wanted to keep this flush because as I mentioned before we've got very very little space to the top of where the, if you like, the running board comes. All right, I've just got this set up now to silver solder the top part into position. All right, there's the top part of our oil reservoir silver soldered into position. And um, what I'll quickly do now is put a little plate on the bottom and silver solder that. Okay, here it is, all uh, silver soldered up now, and I've silver soldered the base on, and uh, so we're all we're all fixed up there. All I need to do now is put a feed tube from here that'll go to the inlet manifold of the cylinders, which is something we'll see a little bit later on. So what I'll do is pop this in some pickling solution just to finally clear off. And in the next episode, we'll mount it uh, into position and then do a final assembly. So I hope you've liked this video. If you have, hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. And look forward to seeing you again soon.